So today we're discussing chapter 4, section 1, the development of a new atomic model. And this comes about because Rutherford's model, which we previously discussed, was incomplete. It didn't explain why the nucleus, which we'll represent by that ball here, uh, didn't just fly apart, because if you'll remember, the nucleus is made up of a bunch of positive charges, and if you have like charges that are really close to each other, they should try to fly apart. But they don't. They sort of sit there in the middle. And it also didn't explain why the electrons that are in the area around the nucleus, which are negatively charged, why these electrons, which are points on here, don't just fall into the nucleus due to their attraction to the positive charge. So they had to develop a new model and after some experiments with light, they came up with some new ideas. So as they looked into the properties of white light, they figured out that it could behave as both a particle and a wave. Now what you have to understand is that the light we see is a form of what's known as electromagnetic radiation. Now, so are radio waves, UV rays, uh, X-rays, gamma rays. There's all kinds of different electromagnetic radiation. And we actually see a tiny part of what's known as the electromagnetic spectrum. And I'll give you an example right here. Now, you can't see the labels on it, but radio waves and stuff are down here. And it goes through to visual light is about here. And then it goes all the way through to what are known as gamma rays on the end. And here are some examples of the size. Gamma rays have a wavelength, which is the distance between two troughs, represented by the Greek letter lambda, about the size of a nucleus. And there's two properties of waves, two basic properties at least. There is the wavelength, lambda, which is the distance between two tr crests or troughs in the wave as well as what's known as the frequency, and that is how many of these crests pass by every second. Now if you take these two numbers, lambda, which is the distance between crests, and the frequency, which is how many pass per second, and you multiply them, what you end up finding is that it equals a constant, c. And this c is a very important number. This is the speed of light, which is, which comes out to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, approximately. Now because c always comes out to be this number, it means that lambda and f, the wavelength and frequency, are inversely related, meaning that if one goes up, the other has to go down in order to maintain this constant over here. So now that we've looked at uh, light as a wave, we're going to look at the basis for light as a particle, and that comes from a effect in nature known as the photoelectric effect. And basically what the photoelectric effect is, is if you shine light onto a piece of metal like this, then what you'll get is at a certain minimum frequency, the metal will start emitting electrons. Now, before this frequency, if it's anything below this frequency, you won't get any electrons at all, no matter how much light you're shining on it. However, once you get above this frequency, you'll start getting electrons shooting off, and the more intense the light, the more electrons you'll get. However, to increase the speed of the electrons, what you need to do is increase the frequency. And people were confused about this threshold down here, if you will, because if light were a continuous wave, then what it would do is it would bombard the electrons and get them moving faster and faster and faster continuously until eventually they could escape the atom. So a solution to this phenomenon was initially proposed by a German scientist by the name of Max Planck. And what Planck said was that hot objects and things that emit uh, electromagnetic waves like this 
don't emit them continuously, but rather they are released as sort of packets that still have a wavelength. And he called these packets quanta. Now Planck was able to relate the energy of these quanta to their frequency by the equation E equals HF, where E is the energy in joules. H is what is known as Planck's constant. Now Planck's constant is 6 times 6.626, rather, times 10 to the negative 34. So an absolutely minuscule number, joule seconds, and frequency is seconds to the negative 1. Now, it's important to use the units on Planck's constant because if you'll notice, you need the S to cancel out with this S1 and then you're left with the joules to give you the energy. And this is how he was able to relate frequency to energy and still maintain a particle idea of light. Now, building off his equation E equals HF, he proposed a new idea, which is something called the quantum, which is basically the minimum energy that a atom or molecule can absorb or uh, lose. Now, this, interestingly enough, is the reason why glass, a pane of glass, is see-through, is because the photons of visual light, which remember, have a frequency because they are electromagnetic radiation, uh, don't have a high enough frequency though to have the energy which equals the quantum of the glass. Basically, they don't carry enough energy to excite an atom, so what they end up doing is they just pass straight through. Now Einstein further built upon this idea by explaining that light is a wave-like stream of particles called photons. And he said that atoms and molecules could only absorb whole numbers of photons. So you can't have half a photon. You have to absorb the whole packet if you're going to take the thing. You can't divide it in half like that. And so as you can see, if you have to absorb whole numbers of photons, what you end up happening, what you end up doing is limiting the amount of energy you can take in at one time. If you're not getting a continuous beam of, or a continuous ray of light constantly bombarding an electron, then what happens is the electron quickly absorbs and then re-emits. It'll absorb it and then quickly re-emit the photon. But if you were to have a continuous wave, as many people proposed, what this would do is it would constantly bombard the electron and any frequency of light would be able to push it off if you just had enough intensity and shined it at the electron for long enough. But Einstein, building on Planck's idea of quanta, explained using photons that you have to absorb whole numbers, therefore there's a minimum energy required based on this frequency here to build up enough momentum to knock an electron out of place. And this in effect explained the previous mystery behind the photoelectric effect. So now we're going to be studying the hydrogen atom line emission spectrum which is a fancy way of saying uh, we're studying the wavelengths of light that hydrogen emits when it's excited. Now we'll get into all the technical details about what all those terms mean, but first thing you have to know is that atoms have something called energy states. And what these en energy states are is a measure of the kinetic energy or the temperature. Basically how fast an atom's moving as well as the potential energy of the atom. And the lowest state an atom can be in is something called the ground state. And for these explanations, I'm going to use the simple Bohr model of the atom, which we'll discuss later. However, you do need to know that the lowest energy state 
of an atom is called the ground state. And then anything that is higher energy than the ground state is called the excited state. Now, how did people found, find this out? So what they did was they decided to excite the atoms. Basically what they did was they passed an electric current through hydrogen gas. And what they found was that this hydrogen gas then emitted a pink light. But when they broke up this light, they found out that it was not a continuous spectrum. Rather, it was made of only four colors in the visible spectrum. And these colors correspond to the different wavelengths of light released by the hydrogen atoms after being excited by this electric current going back to their ground state. So now we'll get back over to these diagrams I have on the left which are what are known as Bohr models of atoms and they're named after a man named Niels Bohr and Bohr proposed that electrons went around the atom in stable circular or elliptical orbits like I have drawn here. And he proposed also that the lowest energy state was when the electron was close here, which is why I have the ground state with the electron very close to the nucleus with a larger distance in the excited state. And basically he proposed that electrons could move from this ground state to the higher state by absorbing a photon of light. And what this would do it was, is it would impart more energy, energy into the electron and move it higher up. However, he also said there were only a few select stable orbits corresponding to these various lines found in the spectrum. Sort of like the rungs on a ladder. So you can go from the bottom rung up one, two, or three, but you can't be on rung 1.5. Basically, you can increase your gravitational energy by going up at whole numbers to stable rungs, if you will, corresponding to the stable orbits. And the method for moving between these rungs or orbits was the absorbing and re-emission of photons given by the energy difference between the orbits, E equals HF. So you can see if there's only a few select orbits, you're only going to get a few select frequencies when you change the energy, which is why they only got four lines when they measured the spectrum of excited hydrogen. However, further advanced applications came to realize that this model only worked for hydrogen.